Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olwen Williams. I'm the Vice President of the Royal College of Physicians in Wales. And it's a great honour this afternoon to actually be chairing the 2023-22 oh, Linica Lecture, which is really intriguingly entitled Humanity's First Chance, Understanding What Pan Pandemic Infection Can Do to the Brain. We have the great privilege of Professor Benedict D. Michael, who will really explore the uh, pandemic's infection can do to the human, human brain. Ben, I'm told he's called in social terms, <laughs> is Professor of Infection and Neuroscience um, and Honorary Consultant Neurologist at the NH NIHR HPRU, National Institute of Health and Cancer Research, Health Protection Research Unit for Emerging Zoon and Zoonotic Infections, Institute for Infection, Veterinary and Ecolo Ecological Science at um, my old alma mater of Liverpool University, um, a city of culture which is going to see the European Song Contest very soon. So I hope you've got tickets. But with no to do, the floor is yours. Welcome. Marvellous. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm hoping that the AV chaps will put the screen on. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Yes, well, obviously, clearly, it's, it's an absolutely huge honour to be invited to present the, the Linica lecture. Those of you, of course, that did um, do well in your, the observations part of your PACES exam will recognise that the 2022 lecture is being delivered in 2023 uh, because, of course, the pandemic. And it's, that's why it's got three titles. It was first Humanity's First Chance in 2021. Then in 2022, it was understanding what pandemic infection can do to the human brain. And now in 2023 on reflection, it's probably better titled A Few Ways We Were Right and potentially the occasional major way uh, that I personally was wrong. I was asked, in fact, to do the Royal College of Physicians' first lockdown lecture, uh, if you remember those back when COVID first hit. And I started with this very slide of the wonderfully erudite uh, Constantine von Economo, who did such groundbreaking neuropathology work during the Spanish flu outbreak. And he raised a whole host of questions about how viruses in pandemics can affect the brain. Did the virus get into the central nervous system? Was it something about the immune system affecting the central nervous system and getting immune cells into the brain? Or was there a direct internal change happening within the brain. And it became very apparent very early on that maybe up to 70 or 80% of patients in some studies hospitalised with COVID had neurological symptoms like headache and myalgia. Up to maybe 10% had a neurological syndrome like encephalopathy, but I'm a neurologist, we're not interested in that. That's for the old elderly care people, they can deal with the delirium. What we care about is the really nuanced and interesting less than 1% who have a neurological diagnosis. And it was to hunt out these very patients that we set up the coroner's study group, which was a collaboration of the UK's major professional neuroscience bodies, which brought together not just neurology, but the Royal College of Psychiatry, acute medicine, ITU, and the stroke physicians. And it, we set up a portal uh, in February of 2021, uh, 2020. Uh, in March, we were collecting data in real time. Uh, and uh, by uh, April, we'd submitted our paper uh, published in The Lancet Psychiatry. And we were actually able to track the spread of neurological complications of COVID, uh, mapping against that first exponential rise in the pandemic. When we looked at what these patients had, about uh, two thirds had a stroke, which by that point was well recognized with COVID but about a third had an alteration in their mental status. And when we looked at these patients, it wasn't just elderly people. About half of them were under the age of 60 and about a quarter were in their 20s, 30s and 40s. And when we tracked these altered mental state patients uh, against the, uh, the light, uh, there we go. So the, this is just hospitalized cases in the dotted gray. The thick black line is the strokes happening early on and then declining as the pandemic, that first wave declined but the altered mental status patients in dots and dashes seemed to rise, giving us an early pointer towards what the pathophysiology might be that's distinct between strokes and altered mental status. But clearly to get at this, we'd need really detailed clinical data. So we went back to all the reporting doctors uh, and we got clinical data back on 267. About a third were female, about a fifth were from black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups, and just under half were under the age of 60 uh, and almost all had uh, WHO uh, confirmed or probable COVID. And when we looked at the time of COVID symptoms to the time of the neurological complication, what was really striking was that 
Just as we'd seen in our epidemiological data, when we looked at the clinical data, the strokes tended to occur at or around the time of COVID symptoms, whereas the altered mental status patients, particularly those with cerebral inflammatory disorders or psychiatric presentations, presented statistically significantly later, around about two weeks after COVID symptoms. And overall, about a quarter presented with their neurology after they'd recovered from their respiratory symptoms, and about a quarter presented with just neurology in the absence of COVID respiratory symptoms. Uh, and these would go on to help support the WHO uh, screening criteria for COVID. In the interest of time, I won't take you through all the different complications, but rather hone in on this group of encephalopathy, and in particular, this group of very severe encephalopathic patients. So this is above and beyond what would meet the criteria for delirium. And they often had multi-system disease with renal and cardiac complications of COVID. Sometimes it was seizures decompensating in people with neurodegenerative disease. But in a small but very interesting group, there were patients who presented with COVID and then seizures and altered mental status in otherwise fit and well young people, often requiring long-term hospitalization. Now we struggled for MRIs often uh, during that really acute phase of the pandemic. I'm, I'm sure you all remember it well. Um, but colleagues of ours who I was working with in the US and in Italy, uh, particularly Alessandro Padovani's uh, European group uh, out of Italy, were MRIing their encephalopathic patients. And they found a whole range of pathologies, sometimes a diffuse leukoencephalopathy, sometimes acute necrotizing encephalopathy or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or limbic encephalitis. So maybe this encephalopathy that I'd originally poo-pooed as just a delirium that just happened to old people uh, was wrong. And obviously, there's one thing looking in the UK. Clearly, this was a global pandemic, and we'd have to look internationally. Uh, and working with Tom Solomon and his team, uh, we did an individual patient data meta-analysis of 83 studies across uh, the globe and got IPD data for just under 2,000 patients and indeed confirmed that encephalopathy was, in fact, the most common cause of uh, uh, complication of COVID uh, around the world um, and about a third of them developing it uh, after hospital admission. So uh, it was about this time that the UK had started to decline in that second peak, but things were really kicking off in India. And we were hearing through the WHO about real problems with hospital wards and car parks full of people uh, with encephalopathy. And our colleagues in India turned to us and said, we don't need your money, what we need is guidelines. So we pulled together the Global Neuro Research Coalition and produced a series of clinical consensus guidelines around managing encephalopathy in COVID. And it's all the things you think about, primary systemic pathophysiologies like hypoxia and uremia and multi-organ dysfunction, none of the things that any of us would miss. But also, importantly, taking the view that when those things aren't present, we ought to look for CNS pathology, for ADEM, for encephalitis, for A&E, for vasculitis and for stroke. Now, the particularly eagle-eyed of you will have seen that I skipped over the paediatrics in our, in our consortium. Um, now, in fact, it was the paediatricians we really wanted because during H1N1, when I was fortunate enough to lead part of the UK's response to that in terms of its neurology, it was all kids. It was all kids with ADEM and A&E that we were seeing with H1N1. So that's really what we, th we thought we'd see with COVID. But we didn't. So despite running a national study over two years, we only identified 52 children with neurological complications of COVID. And they split pretty much 50-50 between those with the multi-system syndrome, PIMS, uh, and those with the primary neurological problem. But when we split those patients apart, again, we see interesting things about the timing of infection to their neurology. Those with PIMS were much more likely to be uh, uh, antibody positive, but PCR negative, and those with primary neurological disorders were much more likely to be PCR positive than antibody positive. Again, suggesting there's something about, or at least some clues about, the timing of infection to the timing of neurology that might point us in the direction of pathophysiology. So, uh, it, at the beginning of the pandemic, it took some persuasion, but I hope now it takes little persuasion that severe and acute neurological, comp neurological complications of COVID-19 do occur, and that they often occur in people who are otherwise healthy. But despite this, the mechanisms are often unresolved and we don't have a good handle on what the role of clinical biomarkers should be. And really, we have to get a handle on this because neurological injury, particularly in younger people, 
can result in lifelong disability. Um, and that's why I was delighted with my, my co-PI uh, from KCL to uh, be awarded a UKRI programme grant to address this very question. And that's the, we're doing through the COVID clinical neuroscience study uh, over these last couple of years, looking at not just the clinical characteristics of these acute complications, but also determining who's at risk and what the medium term sequelae are. And we're looking at uh, trying to identify the underlying pathogenesis, the role of biomarkers, and crucially, whether what we see at the severe end of the wedge in these hospitalized patients actually represents a continuum with what's happening in the community. And it's our overarching hypothesis that if one pulls together markers of CNS inflammation, injury, and genetic risk, we can identify mechanisms driving these complications and their sequelae potentially providing targets for therapy. Now, we're all sat here enjoying this lecture, but many parts of the world are still suffering with COVID. And this is not our first pandemic and certainly not our last. So to do this sort of study, we wanted to do something of global relevance. Um, so working with the World Federation of Neurology, we established a series of clinical case definitions for these various complications uh, and applied them through a global survey uh, in uh, just around 50 or so countries. And we found that it doesn't, it's not just neurologists uh, that are, <laughs> are rubbish. All of us really are pretty bad at distinguishing, even with case vignettes, between encephalopathy, encephalitis, and psychiatric manifestations. And it really became apparent that we'd have to refine and hone these diagnoses iteratively to tease apart uh, what was going on. If we wanted something also that was globally relevant beyond the case definitions, we needed something where just, not just non-neurologists, but non-medics could perform a neurological examination. So we produced a series of open access YouTube training videos uh, and evaluated doctors seeing patients versus uh, uh, research assistants seeing patients versus medical officers seeing patients to evaluate which bits of the examination we could do most accurately. And then of course we wanted to harmonize our tests. Um, one of the things we've done, which is also all the code is open access, is we've harmonized MRI brain scanning, structural and functional MRI brain scanning, um, across not just different institutions, but across different brands of scanners. So we can compare what's happening around the UK and around the world. So there's just over 182 people in the consortium now, uh, and we recruited to target our, uh, just over 800 uh, patients across most of England and Wales, um, and we're doing some further work in Scotland. So I'd like to present some of the findings of our study. All of these patients have been invited back after discharge to perform cognitive testing. And we use a cognitive battery that many of you may have done during the Great British Intelligence Test. And what's fantastic about this is it allows us to compare every single one of our COVID patients to 10 age, sex and education matched community controls from 2019. And when we look at the effects of COVID, we see that even at follow up, the vast majority of patients have global degrees of deficits and particularly those patients that had encephalopathy whilst they were admitted. And what I should make very clear is we excluded people with a prior neurological diagnosis. So these aren't people with dementia who decompensated and got encephalopathic and they had that step change we often see after discharge. These are people who were cognitively normal with no diagnosis, who had encephalopathy, hospitalized with COVID, who even when we see them at 12 to 18 months post-discharge have sustained and fairly global deficits against their matched controls. And those deficits are often not just accuracy, but also response time. So we've started to look in the serum of these patients for brain injury biomarkers, neurofilament light, tau, uh, GFAP, UCHL1 and others. And we find that just having had COVID, even at 12 to 18 months post-discharge, there's elevated levels of some of these brain injury biomarkers in many of these patients, particularly in those who had encephalopathy. So that's a little bit trying to close the stable door after the horse has bolted. What we really wanted to do was go back and see what happened, what was happening at this point of insult. Um, and working with some collaborators in Cambridge, we identified that it was these same brain injury biomarkers which were often upregulated effectively in a dose response relationship relative to the severity of COVID by WHO criteria in the acute phase. Uh, and there was also some suggestion that there might be a dysregulated innate and adaptive immune response. We've now gone on to look in a lot more detail about what is going on at a biomarker level. And when we look in acute samples working with Azaric collaborators, we see elevated levels of neurofilament light and UCHL1 in patients that had COVID, but particularly in patients that had COVID 
with an abnormal Glasgow coma score. So we think that at the point of encephalopathy, we can pick up uh, evidence of brain injury in the blood. When we look specifically at those patients, not just encephalopathic, but those with specific neurological diagnoses, uh, the same pattern follows for NFL and for tau. And when we look specifically at the individual diagnoses, it is unsurprisingly those who've had a stroke, so those who've got a breakdown in their blood-brain barrier and significant parenchymal image, uh, uh, injury that have uh, leakage of these brain proteins into the blood. But also, uh, particularly for tau, we can detect presence of tau protein in the blood of patients who have been encephalopathic, uh, even post-discharge, uh, and in their, their subacute uh, and convalescent plasma, uh, we can detect neurofilament light. Um, now, of course, it's all well and good uh, looking in humans, but you're lucky if you get one blood sample. You're incredibly lucky if you get CSF. Uh, and what we really needed was uh, to look at uh, network analysis. So when we do, uh, this is a, an unbiased Euclidean hierarchical cluster analysis, which creates these heat maps. We see in those patients on your left uh, with an abnormal Glasgow coma score, uh, we see these up regulations, these sort of hot areas. And, these, and this uh, little spinning image here, uh, produced by Kuha and, and Cord, two of my team, show us these really tight networks of correlations of cytokines in those patients with an abnormal Glasgow coma score, which are less tightly upregulated in those people with a normal Glasgow coma score, and uh, in those patients that uh, have a, a neurological diagnosis, we see similar networks, and particularly strong networks for several of these mediators, uh, particularly HGF, IL-6, IL-12P40, IL-1RA, CCL2, and MCSF. Um, whereas when we look at follow-up on the, the right-hand heat map, all that tight up regulation has disappeared. So effectively what we think we're seeing is evidence, biological evidence, of the theoretical cytokine storm. So there is a tight up a synergistic upregulation of many of these inflammatory mediators in concert. Uh, which we don't see at follow-up. We looked really, really hard to see if there might be an adaptive immune response that might be driving some of this. Um, we looked for uh, hundreds of uh, antibodies against uh, the, the antigen chip, uh, and we saw up -regulation, polyclonal upregulation in many antibodies to many of these antigens, particularly CNS antigens, including UCHL1, uh, but they were not necessarily uh, causative for the disease. And again, in the, the heat map at the top there, the sort of network, you can see this really tight up regulation acutely, which then dissipates at follow-up. And we looked hard also for specific autoimmune diseases. Uh, and then you can see some, some rat uh, brain sections there in the bottom left uh, with Sir Roche's team in, in Oxford. Um, and we very, very rarely saw adaptive immune responses with a specific disease, although we have had a handful of cases of NMDA receptor encephalitis and GFAP encephalitis. Now, we looked hard in humans and it generated an awful lot of hypotheses. It became very apparent that, not just from the literature references, but from the few biopsies and post-mortems that we had, that the virus was not in the parenchyma. So there's early worries about anosmia, perhaps being suggesting that there's an olfactory route to the brain. We almost never find virus in the parenchyma, so it's not the virus in the parenchyma. We do, as I hope I've demonstrated, show this profuse and synergistic upregulation of cytokines and immune activation in the acute phase, and these encephalopathic and cerebrovascular complications, and I hope I've been able to demonstrate brain injury biomarkers and cognitive deficits can continue even 12 to 18 months post-discharge. But to get at the biology of this, we were clearly going to need a murine model, where we could test viral titers in the brain and the lung, where we could look at these cytokines, where we could look at blood-brain barrier permeability and immune infiltration into the brain and compare that to brain injury biomarkers. Now, pre-COVID, my work was on viral encephalitis. And this is a murine model I developed at my time in Boston. So this is the um, post-capillary venule. You can see there in the left of an anaeth uh, anaesthetized uh, black six mouse. This is a lysim GFP mouse. So the green things you can see in the top are, are neutrophils in this model. And the red is a Q tracker, an intravenous uh, tracker, which shows you uh, the blood vessels. And in response to HSV infection in the middle, we see this profuse transendothelial migration, postcapillary transendothelial migration of neutrophils into the brain, which swarm around the Verkau-Robin space and damage the blood-brain barrier. 
And what we showed in this study was that we could actually, by blocking that neutrophil signaling, so in a, using a CXCR2 knockout mouse, so these neutrophils cannot detect the chemokine, CXCR1, that's required for the migration. The neutrophils, although they are called to the brain vasculature, are unable to enter the brain, unable to break down the blood-brain barrier, and unable to cause morbidity. So that, that is the model that we thought we were dealing with when it came to COVID. Would it be the virus in the brain? Pretty early on, established it wasn't. Right, it's the immune system. We think cytokines are up, we think chemokines are up. How are they driving leukocyte migration into the brain? So we developed a model. This is a, a human transgenic ACE2 mouse. So they express the human ACE2 receptor on a, on a black six background. And we used a human isolate of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and here we did an inoculum of, of sham infection with PBS intranasally, or a one to the three or one to the four plaque forming units. And what you can see there in the lung is actually a dose response relationship between control, 10 to the three and 10 to the four of this migration of mononuclear cells into the inflamed lung in response to infection. Similarly, in the brain at the bottom by IHC, you can see in comparison to a healthy brain on the left, this dose response relationship of the migration of inflammatory monocytes into the brain. Uh, and here is confocal microscopy, uh, just looking now at the low dose, just at 10 to the three, uh, and you can see either one positive immune cells, you can see yellow spike in the lung, but in the brain, no spike protein, but yet microglial activation, IBO1 staining. And what's really exciting about this model is that if we compare the 10 to the 3 to the 10 to the 4 here in these graphs on the right, you can see that yes, we can detect the N1 and subgenomic E in the lung with both doses of infection, but when it comes to the brain, whilst we can detect N1, protein, we, uh, transcript, we cannot detect subgenomic E in the brain parenchyma of perfused brains in this model at the low dose. So what that's telling us is there is no active viral replication in the brain, just like we see in humans. But despite the absence of viral replication in the brain, when we look at this low dose model, we see uh, the IBA1 staining come up. So here is uh, lung at the top and brain is the four below. So lung, very similarly, CD45 positive yellow immune cells in the lung and in the brain, IBA1 positive microglia. And not only is there increased microglial density, there's also increased microglial intensity and also increased microglial activation. And this is really important because there is no active viral replication in the brain. This must be a para-infectious process which involves microgliosis and as you can see at the bottom with GFAP uh, staining, astrocytosis also. And many of the host inflammatory mediators that we saw upregulated in humans are upregulated also in the lung of these, in this mouse model, but not in the brain. So this is a para-infectious process. So that leaves us what, with what we think is going on. There is this uh, human uh, at the top and, and mouse model at the bottom. Uh, cartoon, we think that in the acute phase, particularly in those patients with an abnormal GCS, there is a large rise in virus in autoantibodies and in pro-inflammatory cytokines that relatively rapidly, particularly the cytokine chemokine signature, melts away. Perhaps there's a slightly longer lag in the antibodies in the occasional patient, but the brain injury biomarkers continue to be detected even 12 to 18 months after discharge. And our model represents active viral uh, infection in the lung with pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and immune cell infiltrate whereas in the brain, there's no active viral replication, but yet pro-inflammatory cytokines and microglial activity. So what does this mean for our patients? Well, we looked uh, hard at what was happening, and what was wonderful in the UK was we all changed practice at, at the same time to the DICTAC we were given. So we were able to track the introduction of dexamethasone and remdesivir and show that actually the rates of neurological complications declined in those patients that had dexamethasone and also those patients that had remdesivir with an additive effect. So I'll draw things to a close with our conclusions. It's very clear that COVID-19 can cause a very broad spectrum of neurological problems. And perhaps it's, in fact, those encephalopathic patients that I was so eager to exclude from our study that might indeed be the most important. The nature of these complications, their outcomes vary, in part related to your pre-COVID status. And whilst the pathophysi pathophysiology remains unclear, we're getting closer to an understanding of the timing from infection to the timing of the complication that suggests there's pathophysiology which is occurring during the viremic, during the innate and the adaptive phases. And I started with von Economo, and it's where I'll end. I mean, our, our work has raised as many questions as it's answered, but 
unlike von Economo, who relied on just neuropathology, we have found by coming together through what were previously research and clinically siloed networks of stroke, ITU, acute medicine, neurology, and psychiatry, and connected as we are globally, this really does represent humanity's first chance to understand how pandemic infections can affect the brain. And as I've said, this is not our first pandemic. It will not be our last. But what we can learn from all of the tragedy of COVID could potentially help humanity be better prepared for the pandemic yet to come. I'd like to thank Professors Patrick Chinnery and Angela Vincent, who chair our steering committee, uh, all uh, those that have been involved in this work, um, my uh, wonderful team uh, of academics and clinicians uh, in Liverpool, um, all you wonderful people who recruited patients uh, to our study, our marvellous third sector partners, particularly the Encephalitis Society. And if you'd like real-time updates, we do a monthly free open access uh, WHO-funded clinical exchange platform about global neurology, uh, global brain health, in fact. Uh, and lastly, to, of course, thank the Royal College of Physicians for the great honour of being able to give this Linica lecture. Thank you all. Absolutely fascinating um, presentation. Um, I don't have any questions online. Have we got any questions from, yes, gentlemen in the middle? And we'll come to you, Lee. Let's wait for the mic, please, because it's, it's, it's been recorded, so our home audience would like to hear what you've got to say. Apologies. I was just really interested in the para-infectious phenomena that you found in the CNS of the mouse, and I was wondering if you have already tested how much of that phenotype is actually specific to SARS-CoV-2, as opposed to more generally applicable um, to viral infectious or infectious diseases at all, and all the lungs specifically versus the gut versus the skin. Yeah, that's a great question. So how much is specific to SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. Um, so there's one element that SARS-CoV-2, because it causes an endotheliopathy, I think that is quite unusual in comparison, for example, to H1N1. And I think that's why with SARS we saw so much multi-system disease. And as I said, some of the very severely encephalopathic patients had, had vasculitis effectively of the kidney or, or myocarditis uh, along with their, with their CNS complications. But beyond that, actually, um, I would uh, posit that perhaps the unique thing about SARS-CoV-2 was only its capacity to infect a large number of people. And it's once you have a denominator that large, these relatively rare complications actually become large enough to study. Uh, and in fact, it, it was that, that very hypothesis that, that led to the title of, of the talk. You know, this is our, this is our chance. Thank you. I want to hand the uh, mic down. Thank you. Um, uh, Jackie Small, paediatrician from Australia. So it's nice to see Australia lighting up then. Uh, remarkable work and presentation. Thank you. Um, so I've got a couple of questions. One is really to confirm what I think you mentioned in passing, that children don't, aren't really experiencing these types of adverse neurological effects from COVID. And the other is that you've um, made a statement about global impacts from um, uh, COVID on the brain. Uh, were you referring to global impacts from a neuropsychological perspective or can there be specific patterns on neuropsych testing? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I'm very much not a paediatrician, so I, I um, no, uh, well, it, uh, we didn't see that many paediatric cases in the UK, and there haven't been a large number, as my understanding of the literature of paediatric cases reported. Now, why children don't have this, the, these neurological complications is unclear. When it comes to the cerebrovascular complications, we found that the biggest predictors were often modifiable risk factors like uncontrolled diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, often things that children don't have. Um, so perhaps that's why the strokes were, uh, we were seeing it in the older group. But I mean, we, I think we should probably should not ignore um, those children who were incredibly severely affected. Of course, the, the pediatric inflammatory multi-system syndrome temporarily associated with COVID or PIMS-TS, uh, who were um, more likely to be of uh, black or Asian uh, uh, ethnicity. And, and had a multi-system, uh, and as you'll be aware, incredibly uh, severe syndrome. But it's, it does seem to be relatively rare. Um, and then the question is globally. Yeah, so I didn't, I'm a neurologist. My, my immediate gut reaction was that we shouldn't involve the psychiatrists. 
um, because that would just muddy the water. But I'm really glad we did, uh, because many of the psychiatric patients proved to have inflammatory changes in the brain. So um, in terms of the global burden of neurology as opposed to the global burden of mental health disorders, um, over the millennia there's been a slight concertinering between neurology and psychiatry of specialties, uh, and COVID has really brought us back together again. So I think the, the neurological and the mental health burdens of COVID potentially are something which you ought to assess simultaneously. Oh, I see. Neuropsychology testing, yeah. Not beyond cognitive testing and questionnaires. So they all get um, all the standard battery of, of neuropsychological questionnaires you'd expect for depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, and chronic fatigue syndrome. They all get those batteries of questionnaires, but formal in-person neurological psych neuropsychological testing we haven't done. Uh, I currently have a grant in, uh, under consideration with the MRC to, to, to do that over five years. So if there's anyone from the MRC that's listening, we'd be delighted if you'd fund us to follow up these patients and do detailed neuropsychological workups on them. And that's why that's important, of course, is we want to know what this means for the aging brain. We want to know what's coming down the pike. Thank you. That's been an absolutely fascinating speed through your work and, you know, the impact of sort of collaboration across mm. the globe is, is, you know, is paying off here. So thank you very much. Just let me have one thing to do, and that's to present you with your certificate for delivering the Linica lecture. Thank you very yeah, much. You're welcome. Thank you all very much. Um, we're on to breathe, get yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and we'll see you back here in quarter of an hour. <laughs>